Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our session today, The Great Consolidation, How to Invest in a Winning MarTech Strategy. I'm Becca Fisher, Marketing Campaign Manager at Acton Software. I'll be kind of introing and outroing today um, while we're joined by our, by our other fabulous presenters from Zoom Info. Before we get started, I wanted to just give a little bit of a refresher on what we'll be talking about today while others continue to join. Uh, so experts from Forrester predict marketers will lean into more marketing automation solutions and personalization tools in the coming year. The catch? Only one out of four of those efforts will reach a return on investment goals. The root of that stunning shortfall, analysts say, is a lack of insights into the prospective buyer. So how can you, as a marketer, tap into your MarTech stack to pull the right data that will help personalize journeys and convert your buyers? During this session, you guys are gonna hear about where exactly to invest in your MarTech strategy, why consolidating your MarTech stack is important right now, the important building blocks to a solid marketing tech stack, and lastly, put it all together, how do you unite your data for better personalization and automation strategies? Before we jump in, um, I just wanna cover off on those classic administrative items. So first, you guessed it, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive that on-demand recording within two business days of this event. Um, and if you would like to present some questions to us, please use that handy Q&A box on your screen. Um, we will either have time for them during the presentation or we also have some dedicated time at the end for Q&A. And lastly, there is a brief survey that pops up at the conclusion of this webinar. So we'd love to get your feedback on today's session and how we can improve this moving forward. And with that, I wanted to welcome today's presenters. Uh, Hassan, would you like to kick things off? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Hassan al Mutar. I am the Senior Director of Strategic uh, and Partner Marketing here at Zoom Info. Wonderful. Good afternoon, Andrew. everyone. I'm Andrew McCraith. I'm here with Acton. I lead our partnerships and alliances as we drive growth uh, by working closely with that breadth of ecosystem partners. Excited to be here and, and share our insights with you today. And I'm Lauren McHugh. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager for our marketing solutions here at Zoom Info. Great. Thanks all for introducing yourself. Um, we're going to jump into a quick poll question here. We just want to get an understanding of where everyone who's joined us is at today with their MarTech stack. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch that. Uh, we're just curious, you know, how many tools exist in your current or, you know, if you have a few um, that you're going to add to your MarTech stack uh, strategy in the coming year. We're just, we want to know. Uh, we want to know how we can provide the best advice for you today. So feel free to go ahead and answer that poll question. Um, Andrew, Lauren, Hassam, do you, you guys have a guess as to like what the winner might be for a number of tools? I'm definitely saying six plus. I'm joining Lauren's camp. <laughs> I'll be the, the uh, guy going against the tide and say three, maybe four, because I think we have several people attending who are a bit newer on their journey, um, mm -hmm. getting their first platforms, sure. learning how to, to, to add data and do more. So maybe they don't have as many tools yet. Awesome. That's a good approach, Andrew. I like that. That's a good approach. Nice. It, it's All not right. an either or, it's both. So. <laughs> Definitely. Well, the results are... Um, looks like six plus one by just like very slightly from one to two. So Andrew, you were right in the middle there with the three to four. I think so. that is also telling if you think of one to five being the majority in there, a significant mm -hmm. majority also. So that's yeah. a, that's good to see. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks everyone on the call for answering that. All right, and I'll just hand off the wheels to Lauren uh, to continue moderating today's uh, presentation. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we're excited to be here and talk about uh, MarTech Stack. Even if you're just getting started in your journey, uh, we know the importance of consolidation, making sure your data flows back and forth between your platforms, and then uh, obviously the management of them all as well. 
So to get started, we're going to definitely start with why consolidating your MarTech stack is important right now. I know some of you might have one or two, but it's still even important to make sure that those are working together. So Hassam, I'll start with you since I know you better and I can call on you first. <laughs> can you give <laughs> examples of why consolidation and evaluation of the current MarTech uh, strategy in stack is important at this moment? Yeah, so I think uh, um, the the numbers are fairly representative, right? We we just saw um, there is the the majority is going between two and and five, and then we do have a, a significant chunk of folks that have six plus tools on their um, on their stacks, right? Um, if you think of where we are currently, the first th the first place for me to start talking about. Uh, consolidation is economically. Um, right now, we're in a spot of uncertainty, um, for the lack of a better term. We're we're headed towards a recession or conversations about recessions. Where we're in a little bit of an economic turmoil, where organizations are kind of like at a at a at a place where they need to make a decision of how much do I spend um, on, on the tools do I have and what is the area of focus? So consolidation of your tech stack comes in at the, the, the point of efficiency. And the majority of organizations, specifically when I'm talking about uh, uh, some of the organizations and the customers that we talk to at Zoom Info, we notice this trend of consolidation that I, in the face of uncertainty, I do not want to be spread thin against a whole a lot of different tools that are kind of complementing each other to a certain degree. That's why they are stack. Um, but I, I don't want to continue to spread out myself thin uh, with different contracts, different obligations, different kind of uh, um, uh, kind of like uh, financial uh, commitments that I'm making towards different vendors that I have. So consolidating gives me a little bit of an, an edge in an economic uncertainty. And that's what the trend that we're seeing with our customers. Yeah, that's a great point. Andrew, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, I'd add on, um, it can be reducing the number of vendors, but it's also just consolidating your processes around those tools. Hmm. And so having integrations that make data flow between your tools really easy uh, is just as important. Because if you can get rid of all that manual load and unload and segmentation, that frees up your other people resources to do what they really enjoy, which is creative and driving programs and campaigns, not managing vendors and doing manual tasks. And so I see it as reducing the number of systems and dashboards, but even more importantly, it's just reducing all that manual uh, interchange. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and we all know that, that how cumbersome that can be and time consuming. So that's a really great point. So keeping on the topic, from your perspective, uh, I'll stick with you, Andrew. How should marketers be thinking about uh, buyer behavior in a B2B world? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's to look forward and try and throw everything you knew from a year or two out the window. Uh, <laughs> it's not just because of COVID. I mean, buyers are just smarter than they used to be. They, they often are, are doing their research before they show up. Uh, it's not uncommon. The buyer knows more than the salesperson they're contacting. And so... Uh, it, just throwing everything we knew out the window and reassessing how they operate so we can really change how we engage with them. Um, and how that manifests is different for each of us in our industries, our geographies, you know, the size of the company. But it's not like a digital transformation is just happening now. It's been going on and it's going to keep going. It's not done. Mm -hmm. And so that's it's a really hard thing for us to do to to throw those past experiences and biases out the window. But I, I would encourage all of us to do that. And you almost have to do it every 12 to 24 months right now because it, it's changing that fast. Yeah, that's true. We were just even talking about it right before we started about uh, like the consumption of things as well. So like we were talking about how I usually watch webinar, like I'll sign up for a webinar I wanna watch, but I most 99% of the time will watch it on demand because mm -hmm. of everything else that we have going on. So consumer behaviors, it's no longer needing to feel like you have to watch it right then. You have the op option and uh, streaming services obviously impact some of that, but it's a great point about assessing how uh, your buyers are behaving as well. Hassan, do you have anything that you'd like to add? So 
I think uh, uh, it's a great great point on on uh, um, the, the, that kind of assessment. Um, I think it it, it also uh, important for us to to recognize that sure digital digital transformation has been around and it, it enabled us to look at buyer behavior in such a significantly insightful way um, today compared to 10 years ago um, it's also important to remember that with digital transformation we've uh, we've created or we have the tendency of creating silos in our data um, in in uh, what I would urge um, in kind of like the uh, push uh, marketers to think about from a behavior or a consumer buyer behavior perspective is to try to actually remove some of these silos in order to um, understand the behavior a little better, right? Um, with every silo that you introduce in your databases and your data warehouses, um, you introduce uh, um, some loss in translation. If, I, if I'm matching my website behavior, for example, um, in one platform, and then I'm looking at at uh, uh, chat behavior, for example, on another platform. These are two separate silos, and connecting mm -hmm. the the user and the intelligence of that user is subjected to translation of what that that data silo uh, looks at. So, trying in in removing the 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 uh, the silos in between the the different um, data warehouses that you have, the intelligence that you're you're uh, tracking on your buyer behavior, um, is basically the foundation for you to understand at a better level how the user behavior or the buyer behavior is changing and what can you do to adapt for it. Yeah, those are great points. To evolve off of that a little bit, um, I know we were talking about not only consolidating the tech stack itself, but the processes around it. Where would you invest uh, your spend and time if we are consolidating the technology specifically is what we're going to move into. And so uh, the main question I wanted to talk about or the first question I want to talk about was what are some core principles that marketers should consider when planning their technology stack? Uh, future longevity, single customer view, full integration, et cetera. What do you think, Hassan? I think I'm I'm a stick to my ground. Uh, I think that's where my my strength comes in uh, of understanding these things. Um, I think I'm sticking to um, buyer insights, um, understanding the um, the engagement intelligence for a lack of a better term. I think to your to, to the point earlier that we were talking about, we we were emphasizing the buyer behavior. Um mm -hmm. understanding that that behavior um needs for us to provide a different kind of engagement going forward. And and engaging with our buyers have significantly changed over time. If you if we remember maybe 10 years ago, there was there was an emphasis of of understanding what scoring would look like, elite scoring. I remember 10 years ago I had invested a lot of time and money into understanding and developing lead lead scoring mechanisms and made it the Bible for our teams, only for us to understand that we need to move a little bit forward from there and and kind of uh, translate our um, engagement applications in a different way using the buyer intelligence. So I think it's really important when we are talking about the principles that we understand how how we apply the buyer behavior intelligence to the level that we're engaging with them and engage meaningfully um, as opposed to jamming things down people's throat and hope for the best. <laughs> good point, good point. Andrew, anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I, I think one of the the kind of evolving trends and challenges to take advantage of is the, the window of opportunity when you have that potential buyer's attention. And it comes down to, to two things to execute on. One, if you don't reach out to them, uh, you're gonna miss that window. Mm -hmm. So finding ways that you can engage them uh, repeatedly so that you're present when they are in market uh, and when you have that person, you know, between their Zoom meetings or on their commute or whatever that window of the day is that they're going to be looking. Um, and so just relying on one email isn't good enough. You got to try lots yeah. of ways from lots of directions. And then the follow on to that is when they are in the moment and they're ready to talk to you, how do you know that 
and be prepared to actually jump on it. And, and I think real time readiness and response is going to be a bigger and bigger theme. Um, and at the root of all of that is having the data so you know who those prospects are. Yeah. How do you target them? What time of day? What content? What's you know working for them? Um, and having their full profile. You know, the more you know about them and their behavior, the better you can do that. But also then knowing that they're here real time. Mm -hmm. um, so you can pull in the salesperson or pull in that solution consultant or pull in whomever the right person is while you have their attention. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, just to get a little bit personal now, um, Andrew, from your experience, where have you failed? Oh, you can choose which one. Where have you failed <laughs> or seen the most success in your MarTech strategy? Uh, so the, the most success <laughs> I've seen, I'll, I'll, I'll go with the success first, <laughs> and then I'll give Hussam a chance, and then we'll come back to my failures. Uh, <laughs> it's a long list. Uh, but I, I think the biggest success is when it wasn't a let's wait and get it all perfect. Mm. It was let's just go try a bunch of stuff that's good and go fast. Um, especially on the marketing front, try this message and see what the reaction is. And then go tweak the words mm -hmm. and tweak the cadence and try that other thing um, and not getting hung up on perfect planning. Uh, and so I've, whether that's top of funnel, mid funnel, you know, um, webinars, live events, co-selling, reselling, in all those avenues, it's that attitude of what's going to be, give me flexibility to move quickly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that that's how you stumble upon that thing that's successful. And one of the phrases that I heard recently that I've been living by is, it's only obvious after it's obvious. <laughs> and it takes a lot of work to get to obvious. Yeah. Uh, so the way you get to obvious is just, you know, try and iterate as fast as you can. The more you try, the more iterations, the better you are. Yeah, I love that point. I mean, you can't fail unless you try. So I, I really love the that point. And it's true. I feel like so many marketers try and make it so perfect, but you're missing on the opportunity to see if it works when it's not perfect as well. And I, I just like that point a lot. What about you, Hassam? So I'll match I'll match Andrew's strategy, I guess, in in choosing successes <laughs> first. We're I definitely think... circling back to failures now, though. Since you've it. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks for keeping us honest on this. Um, I think um, from a, a success perspective, the fact that that building a, a, a marketing tech stack competes with marketing programs for budget. Um, what's successful is efficiency. Um, I might have a dream of building this kind of incredible elaborate program that requires me 19 different tools. And I might be the, you know, the, the, the crazy genius that potentially can pull it off, um, orchestrating against 19 different silos. Um, but does that come at the the cost of efficiency? Is mm -hmm. the 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 production from all of these different tools equals the amount of efficiency that I might use the money I put in towards these tools to um, uh, to against programs, for example, against media spend, or against hosting an event, or against whatever other things? So I think a, a well balanced sure we got to try we have to try because but at the end of the day um marketing is trial and error otherwise we wouldn't have measurement and evaluation as a, an incredibly important pillar in how marketing works right um so we have to try and we have to try really quick so we can understand really quick but i think the the most sound um strategy to me or the the most successful that I have been um, involved in one way or the other is the one that emphasizes efficiency um, sure. in, in ROI, measurable, calculated return on investment in revenue from a marketing perspective is one that normally wins in my books. That makes sense. Now you can circle back to your failure. Oh, yeah. oh. I'll go first while you're, you're preparing for that. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I like to look at most of my failures as just 
super early in the stage of my success. Um, so putting that silver lining on it. But I, I think one that I held on to for too long um, and have come full circle on is marketing automation is not the end all be all. Hmm. Uh, that is not the one thing that's going to deliver, you know, kumbaya for marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you absolutely need it, but you need to do more than that. So mm -hmm. you need to take your marketing automation and complement it with account-based marketing and account-based mm -hmm. selling. Um, and the way you do that uh, is leveraging data, combining it with your marketing. Um, don't worry about having an, an overbloated, you know, legacy marketing automation platform. Get, get a best of breed solution that's really focused on marketing automation and then complement it with data like from Zoom Info so you can then uh, layer on ABM to that. Because it's not a question of do we go wide or do we go deep? The real question is how do I do both? Um, and that's where you need marketing automation plus ABM with your data uh, mm -hmm. as a backbone to that. Uh, and that was a, a big aha moment for me a few years ago um, was ABM and marketing automation are not fighting each other. They should be together. Uh, okay. So I've now turned that into a success from a, a few years ago. <laughs> failure. That's sneaky. That's how you succeed. <laughs> fail and fail again. <laughs> I think um, for, for me, the, 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 failures that I've, uh, from a tech stack perspective um, and being in, in marketing operations uh, roles before, I think I come back to the times where I was really, really distracted by shiny objects, so to yeah. speak, um, to the point that it didn't matter to me to a sense when that shiny object was tested or not. So new technologies that came in, um, I was one of the first to jump right on him. Um, in in they weren't failure in the sense that they didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. The failure is to under uh, was to, was to th that I failed to understand what the value really was. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, not understanding the value of a product that I'm about to to hitch my wagon into, and I'm going to spend you know like commit to it on a. Um, uh, uh, on an annual basis or at least quarterly basis, uh, put me at a at a disadvantage because I I needed to make it work and I put more effort into making it work than than I could have make other things that were more tested more um, uh, available for me mm -hmm. work. Um, and not to get into specifics, but I think uh, the failure that I've had was not in in getting the technology. Um, to Andrew's point earlier. I had to try. I mm -hmm. am the one that tries and gets the new things and and tries the 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 new technologies, but in not really paying um, attention to the value prop and and how is it going to scale inside of my my existing tech? Is it a point solution that is specific for one tiny little pain point, mm -hmm. or can I scale it up to different things? As a marketer, I'm always being asked to scale up efforts, scale up efforts. And if a tool that I had just hitched my wagon into doesn't scale with me, then that is a recipe for failure for sure. Yeah. And sort of to evolve off of that, um, some common KPIs that organizations should be using to measure performance. We often talk about process efficiency, what you were just saying, uh, cost optimization, et cetera. What are some of the common KPIs that you would suggest um, our listeners look into when they're measuring their MarTech performance? I'll stick with you, Hassan. I think it, it, it goes back to how we're engaging with our prospects, with our buyers. Um, obviously, uh, process efficiency, which is severely subjective to a given organization and the way that they work, um, cost efficiency efficient, efficiency uh, is another really important metric. Um, but I think when you're using, when, when we're building the tech stacks, we're building them because we're also building a user experience with them. Yeah. Um, and the user experience need to deliver on more insights and more engagement. I am a big advocate of engagement. 
um, how I how am I engaging with the buyer on a lot of different levels, whether it be it on my website, is it being is it converting uh, mm -hmm. in form fills, but more importantly, is my content uh, engaging enough for me to drive more and more consumption. We earlier today, we talked about binging and binging content and binging videos, but that's, that's another form that we're conditioned mm -hmm. these days to binge. And if I'm not providing the value enough that I am not, um, I'm not binging. So I guess engagement is, is a really good metric. I know that one is, um, uh, fairly subjective and can, someone can figure out a different way of measuring engagement, but it, engagement across your targeted accounts, across the personas that, that you're, uh, normally, uh, um, attracting and engaging with, uh, is, is a, is a very good KPI for you. What is out of your list of, uh, of your database? What is the percentage of your data? database actually engaged with your content, whether it be website or emails, okay. since we're talking about ba uh, databases. Um, and and uh, uh, how are you moving this? How are you utilizing the tech stack throughout the funnel? Are you using it at just at the top to generate leads and then stop it there? Um, or is your tech stack supporting you end to end? Okay. What about you, Andrew? Anything you'd like to add into that? What yeah, KPIs do you follow? Yeah, and, and I've been moving back and forth between marketing and sales and, and the blend points in between. And where I've seen a lot of the best success is, uh, you know, when those two teams are working hand in hand. Mm. So beyond engagement, it's breadth of engagement. So not just how many activities with that account or with that contact, but how many different avenues are we successfully engaging with them? Once you get two or three, once they're talking to two or three people from your company, or you're speaking with two or three people at their company, then things really start to happen. Yeah. That's more powerful to me than there's one individual and they've read 20 eBooks. Um, I'd rather get that breadth of touch because then you have the whole water cooler effect. That yeah. You're never going to measure directly, but if they're hearing about you in several directions, they're chatting about you, um, they're reading about you, That that's when the magic will happen. You've moved from if to when. Yeah. Um, that's, and, and that's that's not easy to, to measure. It takes work. But when your systems are well integrated, um, you can start identifying that and really orchestrating um, omni-channel campaigns, uh, which is really powerful and hard to yeah. do without a good tech stack. That's a great point. And in the vein of trying to make the most of what you have, uh, can you, Andrew, can you list off a couple of ways you can stretch uh, your MarTech budget? I mean, there's an obvious one uh, of using Acton as your marketing automation platform. <laughs> uh, but I would say moving beyond that, you know, there's the, tac the tactical one of, you know, negotiate a two or three year contract. You know, you're going to save five, 10. If you're a savvy negotiator, you might get 15% off. Um, but I think the other one is, is look at your tools and see if you're really using everything that you've signed up for. Hmm. I was just going through that today with some of the tools we use for partner management and we're using a fraction of what we bought. Yeah. And so either we need to invest and utilize it, or we need to, to downshift that program. And I, I think a lot of times we, we have bought software with grand visions and we haven't lived up to that. Um, and so another approach to that is as you're buying your next or investing in your next platform uh, or suite or add-on or where in the tech stack, you know, do you need to buy it all up front or can you go in stages um, and have that, that realistic plan that you can grow into? That's a great point. I know a lot of, uh, I feel like it's common everywhere. Even my iPhone, I don't use all the features on it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, you know, we, we do. We do buy. We justify uh, when we buy something that we, we normally are buying to solve a pain point, maybe yeah. a group of pain points. And then we justify yeah. the cost by looking at what other features. Um, I think to, to your point, Andrew, I definitely, we just definitely did go through the, the partner uh, tech stack that we have. And we're looking at what do we, what do we have? So in the same, the same uh, situation, and we find ourselves that we actually buy more than what we need 
Um, and it happened more than once at different organizations that I've worked with or for. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it is a really good uh, uh, kind of uh, um, thought to have that if I'm about to buy a tool, let me go ask a different team what they're using for something adjacent in my pain point. Not my pain point specifically, but adjacent to it. I, I think self-servingly for us at Zoom Info, um, you know, we, we, we're looking, for example, when we're uh, uh, when we look at Chorus as a as a tool um, mm-hmm. that that is uh, available or uh, one of the the offerings of Zoom Info, uh, the most people are buying it for you know people can buy it for multiple different reasons and not always they're going to be combined to the same thing, right? Sometimes mm-hmm. it is for coaching. Sometimes it is for archiving. Sometimes it is for pipeline um, uh, pipeline management. Um, sometimes it is for user insights. But not all the time you'll find people buying the tool for all four um, kind of uh, use cases combined. Put it all four use cases combined. You have sales, sales operations, sales enablement, and marketing to a certain degree. Yeah. I was also going to say, I was going to add on to it and just say like, are there other departments that could utilize what you're also using? Like, like you just said, course is a great example. I'm a product marketer. I listen to customer calls to get product feedback. Um, but it's the same tool that our sales team uses to record those calls and get that coaching, et cetera. So can you pull from another budget could make technically your budget go a little bit further, but that's just my little tidbit of info. And I'd add uh, to that. Yeah. We're definitely yeah. seeing in certain segments, a rise of interest in uh, managed service providers, business process outsourcing, mm. um, letting that third party manage parts of your tech stack for you. Um, it can be hard to find that internal resource to hire yeah, um, and then dedicate them. And a lot of times we forget a big part of our budget. It's not just the tech stack. It's the people to operate it. And so I know at Acton, we've invested a lot in agency partners, services partners who can help offload that appropriate chunk for you. Because that, that's often a hidden cost is all that human capital. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Shifting a little bit of gears. Um, so we just talked about making your budget go a little bit further, but we want to shift into talking about like the building blocks of your solid MarTech stack. So Hassan, from your perspective, what is the foundation of a modern tech stack uh, that everyone listening should have invested in? Yeah, this this comes across again as self-serving, um, <laughs> but it, it genuinely is an ideology that I have, and I work I've worked through this in my entire career. Um, the foundation for um, any marketing tech stack is the quality of the data that you have. Um, if and in, in earlier today, we talked about data silos and the different silos that different tech stack or tech uh, uh, marketing technologies can introduce. Um, the foundation of the, the, a good data foundation that you have is nearly as important mm-hmm. as your entire marketing budget. Um, I joke around sometimes with the, with some of my close friends and I say uh, I... Uh, a marketing team without data is a group of friends hanging out. Um, <laughs> but the the reality is that's true. Uh, and I don't mean it in the sense of, of data that I have to have your email number or email address and phone number, but I have to have insights into what, what, who I'm selling into, right? I ha- especially in today's world, we are facing um, a, a, a really big shift in the way that a buyer is making a purchase in the enterprise side, in the B2B side, in everything that we're, we're, we've been working on. Uh, the, the, this, the, the shift in the way that someone buys is, uh, it corresponds to how you can react to that shift as well, or your performance uh, in that category. So without the like, quality insights into what your buyer is looking into, where they are in a buying cycle. At the end of the day, marketing has an abstracted responsibility of 
uh, making folks aware that they've got problems, making them uh, evaluate uh, uh, the different options, buy my my offering as the right option, use it and advocate for it. And if I don't know where you stand, Lauren, in that cycle of an abstracted marketing journey, then I'm just going to be yelling at you different kinds of messages sounding crazy. And then I'm going to lose you. I might be loud and, and rely on volume to gain efficiency slightly, but in the long run, it is just going to hurt me. So my, my foundation, the best foundation that I could rely on is quality data that mm -hmm. offers breadth and depth in, and of insights into my, my buyers, generally speaking. Yeah, that's a good point. Andrew, what do you have from your perspective? And, and I would that? agree. I think of it as there's three um, buckets that play on each other. The first is, is your data. Like, who are you going to target? And do you know everything you need to know about them so that you can? Uh, but then second is drawing insights on that data, right? Just having data and know uh, so, so what to do with it doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, but then once you generate that insight, um, and we're great at generating insights, you got to make sure you take the right action. Hmm. And so it's the data plus the insights plus the action. And that's where, as you're looking at building out your stack, and I, I saw the chat question, so I'll comment to that in a moment. Um, part of it is, does the, the software, the tech do what I need it to do? Hmm. But then also, is that vendor going to bring expertise with them to help me uh, apply it in the best way to generate the insights and the actions that are most um, valuable. Uh, it's not just, you know, here's your credit card. I have a, a login. Poof, it happens. Yeah. Um, look for those partners that are, are going to bring you some additional expertise uh, as well. Because uh, at the end of the day, that's what uh, is going to get you to the best place. And so I, I saw a chat question about what makes up that stack. And I think there's a lot of pieces. It's a little hard to say because it depends how big you are, where mm -hmm. you're at, B2B versus B2C. But I think purely on the, the marketing side where you need to start um, is you need to have um, data. Uh, you need to have a marketing automation platform, not just for doing email blasts, but overall lead scoring, mm -hmm. identifying those target accounts. Um, if you're getting a little bit more uh, serious. You don't have to be bigger, but if you're getting more serious, um, then the account-based marketing tools um, mm -hmm. would be the next thing I'd be looking to add on to that. And you might want direct mail. Um, you may want website chat, um, gifting platforms. Um, those could all come in too, depending a little bit on, on who you're targeting. Um, and also event management, you know, webinars and all those other um, events that you're driving. Uh, could be necessary. Right. You pretty much this one into uh, our next question uh, organically, but uh, do you have any other ideas around planning and technologies that a marketer may not have considered? I, I really like the point that you made about gifting and um, direct mail. I feel like those are, they seem like classics, but yet they still are effective at times. So um, for example, like what are some some things that you're considering for the rest of 2022 going into 2023, Andrew? I have fallen in love with snail mail. I <laughs> open every single snail mail addressed to me and I open, I don't know, 1% of the email I receive. <laughs> um, I assume a text right now that I get is probably from the Democratic or Republican party. Um, <laughs> it's total spam. I don't even wanna even look at my text messages. But if you send me snail mail, I will open it uh, every time. And so it, it's an oldie but goodie. And it, I think it's coming back if you do it well. And not just for your new customers, your existing customers. Mm -hmm. Don't assume they're coming to a dashboard to see all the success you've delivered for them. Yeah. Um, the customer you have, he may have left and he's been replaced. And the new guy's coming in. Does he, does he even know about you? Yeah. Um, so... One tactic I've used in certain industries, we don't address it to the individual. We address it to their title. Mm. You know, general manager of the Hyundai dealership. Because um, we know that that guy changes every nine months. And so just thinking about some of those old school methods um, 
can be very effective. I second the 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 <laughs> the, uh, the old school methods. It's uh, uh, it's one of one of the the pillars of what we try to do from a marketing perspective is to cut through the clutter. And mm -hmm. to your point, Andrew, I am staring down the barrel of nineteen hundred thirty one emails that are still sitting in my mailbox. Um, in having been read, anxiety, just I, I know I am a zero mailbox kind of guy, but like the amount is just, I can't, I can't keep up with it. So I've decided to ignore it. Um, but I, I also want to highlight, and I, I actually, it, 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 it coincide with a uh, question I just saw, uh, about the upcoming, uh, cookie laws and tracking in the future. I do think that in 2023 and 2022, and that's why I also emphasized at the beginning, the value of engagement is a big one. So I think um, um, as we continue to be more, uh, more privacy focused, more privacy conscious, um, we're also, it's important to remember that we're catching up with the privacy conscious buyer and that's part of the change in the buyer journey so i think it is um it is very important for us to continue to think about the different ways of engaging meaningfully with our um with our efforts right if i have a website i don't want to use the same old um, nine field forms uh, yeah. when I'm asking for somebody to connect with me. Uh, I get it that it's there's a legitimate interest and legitimate need in understanding some of the, the questions that you're asking on the forms, but it is an archaic one. Also, it is the one that makes someone pause. Why do I want to give you this kind of information? You're going to use it against me. So streaming, streamlining the engagements on digital properties um, is, is the number one response of um, the, the, the changes in the privacy laws, the changes in cookies coming up down in 2023, um, and have been continuing to come in. Um, using using intelligent uh, tools like chat, um, mm -hmm. for example, um, using chat on on your uh, on your website, one that can correspond with your visitors intelligently, um, understanding uh, uh, the user behavior. Uh, on your website in a little bit of an, in an aggregated fashion, um, or even better, understanding a, um, a a company's intent and how you use intent, not in a creepy, uh, uh, you know, like I saw your your uh, your company is searching for this kind of topic, but um, making sure that you would have a uh, a response to uh, that, whether it be it from an outbound uh, perspective or an inbound side. And I do see a question that someone says any chat software recommendation i will uh i'll i'll be the first to plug in and say zoom info <laughs> and i would add to that i mean we got all excited about the, the gifting and snail mail for that to really work you need to orchestrate it with your dialing programs with your email with everything else yeah. uh, and that's why you know the marketing automation platforms that have that orchestration where you can have different paths um, is so important so that that can be orchestrated, not just for the benefit of the customer, because the customer likes to feel like everything is unified to them, but also internally. So yeah. your internal teams are all on the same page. Um, and so that may not be a, that's not a whole package you buy, but it's a critical feature you need to be looking at when you're looking at those core systems. Yeah, that's a great point. I was on another webinar and um, the gentleman that we were talking to was saying that he used direct mail and it was his best performing piece and he made it a competition. So he did like a glossy like booklet that he sent to CMOs and on the cover of it was like um, this month's like top CMO of whatever. And it said like at the bottom, do you want to be considered to be the next top CMO? Like contact here or something like that. He said, nothing gets people's attention more than a competition, especially at that level. He's like, I had hundreds of people being like, hey, I think I could be considered the next top CMO. And I was like, that's a genius move on your part, guy. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, um, adding a little competition to it always helps you. And that's I, I, what we want. 
our best marketing people spending their time is thinking of those ideas yeah. and cross coordinating all of our different channels and activities. Um, yeah. We don't want them spending their day pulling data, exporting data, moving it around, dealing yeah. with systems. Yeah. Um, and so having those integrations or outsourcing it to a, a company that can do more of that for you. So you can have those great success stories. Yeah, that's a great I, point. I love that one. Yeah, me too. I, I was like, that's so genius. I, I can't believe I've never thought about that. <laughs> um, shifting into the last section as we are coming close to time, uh, how, do you, how do you unite your data for better personalization strategy? Uh, where do you feel like, Hassam, where should you say personalization should, should reside in an omni-channel tech stack? Um, I think uh, uh, it it resides obviously with intelligence because without without intelligence you cannot personalize. Um, I do caution that we very often, um, as marketers, tend to forget or um, mistranslate personalization for uh, tokens or march fields. Um, High first name isn't personalization. Yeah. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it is just a way for me to scale up mm -hmm. my effort. Uh, but it's not personalization. Uh, personalization comes in from a a, a a good level of understanding of my my journey, my current need, and what my current pain points are. Um, hi Andrew or hi first name is not going to make me stand out, mm -hmm. but Hi, Andrew. I know you're consolidating your your partner um, technology stack right now, and I would like to offer you a, a conversation about this it is a little bit more personalizing. And also, I might mention something about beaches because it feels like Andrew <laughs> is sitting somewhere outside. Knowing all of this is intelligence to a certain degree. Um, yeah. And, and it, it, it helps that, um, that we... Uh, we think about it this way because it, it helps me understand how to orchestrate all of the things that Andrew literally on the previous point made, right? Um, when he said that you need to orchestrate the the phone call with the with the e uh, the email drop with a uh, a direct mail package being delivered and so on and so forth. Yeah. Anything yeah, I, to add, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, there's a big difference in B two B versus B two C. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in B two B. I think the most important piece of the personalization is awareness of the other activity that the contact has already done. Because there's nothing more frustrating when they, they reach out to you and it's the first time for the seventh time. <laughs> it's like, no, I've already been talking to six people. I have a proposal in my hands, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, and you got to know that. You got to know they just came to this great webinar on consolidation um, or they're registered for an event next month. Mm. Uh, and if you don't know that, you just look like you're a step behind um, and yep. it annoys the buyer. And if you yep. do know it, then you can start to anticipate, oh, I just, the sales guy sent him a proposal yesterday. He's on my website looking at success stories. Okay. He's pretty serious. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to respond to him in a personalized way. Uh, and so I think, so in B2B, there's that element. B2C is a different set of, of challenges. Um, but again, you know, know that the, the steps they've already taken, anticipate what they might be looking for. Uh, so you can help them get what they, you want to help them get something more than what they're going to get by Googling. Yeah. Um, and Which is, if you, if you think of it, there's a question I'm looking at, I've been staring at it for a second. Um, how much do you focus on functionality versus out of the box integrations? Um, in, in exactly um, to that point, um, Andrew, is that you under understanding where people stand in all of it? Mm -hmm. uh, you might you might see a tool and you're like, this is the the best kind of function that I could bring into my my stack, but it doesn't sit there. Mm -hmm. You have effectively created not only a silo, a non-connected silo to begin with. Um, that's one piece. The second piece, uh, for every piece of technology, when you're installing or when you're bringing in, you're trying to, to also understand the value of, of that and what is it bringing to your general production, not have it integrated 
means that you don't know what the full picture looks like. And, and um, you don't know if your efforts through that technology or the channel that this technology serves, mm -hmm. did it work? Or was it a perceived kind of, yes, it did work. Um, and the only way that you could tell is by uniting the, the uh, by uniting the data that you have all in one single um, data warehouse, so to speak. Great point. Uh, last question that we were looking to give some insights to, uh, what are some new ways that marketers are segmenting? Uh, could you provide a few examples of what that looks like for you guys? I use some mind-numbing nuances in, <laughs> in our segmenting, but hear me out. It's, it's important that you understand what your TAM or your total addressable market looks like. Um, but if, if, if you do have a, a database or your audience, the more nuances you introduce, the higher your efficiency looks yeah. up, right? Yeah. Um, if I know that for the sake of the example, my tool or my service offerings cost between $50,000 to $80,000 annually, and I know that this is a significant amount of money, um, then I can go and find a nuance on my data set to say, show me only those companies that have seen, seen growth that is a positive growth over the last two years. That is a segment that I would have. The reason being is because that positive growth one usually corresponds with the ability to actually purchase, to make um, investments in, in tools and service offerings and so on and so forth. So as many nuances as I could get, it helps me understand where is my ideal customer. Mm -hmm. Ideal mm -hmm. doesn't mean the only. Ideal means the best, the one yeah. that I could go after today um, and and go and, and win really quickly with that customer as opposed yeah. to the only customer. That's a really large pool. And you don't want to boil the ocean. And as nuanced as you can get with your data sets, with your segments, whether be it, so I, I, historically we've used uh, uh, as examples, uh, number of employees, revenue yep. bands as, as segmenting methodologies, um, areas of function as segmenting methodologies. But then the next step from there, I would certainly look at um, things that are far nuanced. Do they have uh, two, three locations, uh, two to three locations in, in the United States, as an example? Um, do they offer 401k to their employees? These are yeah. all data points that I know I could, uh, I could use that if it correlates to my products and the service offering, I'm definitely going to use. Yeah, great point. Anything to add, Andrew? Uh, I totally agree uh, on the nuances. I mean, there's the classic technographic, firmographic data. Where yeah. are they? How big are they? What industry? Um, but then it's getting super honest with yourself. What is that attribute that <laughs> you really solve? Yeah. Um, and then finding proxies to measure it. I know when I'm out prospecting for partners, because that's my day job, uh, one of the things I look at is, have they partnered before? Mm. Um, and it's not... a whether it's yes or no, it just tells me what my approach to them would be and where we would start. Um, so things like that. Uh, and I think in any segment, there's some unique things. I know we have certain functionality that works extra well and is super differentiated for companies that have multiple brands or multiple yep. franchises. Um, and so looking at that as a, as a, a filter and an attribute works well for us. Um, and, and I think with where our tools are going these days, it's not about having three or four sales plays or three or four segments you target, three or four sales motions. Because hmm. we've been constrained there because that's all a human salesperson can handle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're getting to the point where it's the other direction. It, it's hyper segmentation. We're going to have 500 segments yeah. because I can treat them slightly differently. Oh, you're in the Northeast. My cadence should be, you know, every six hours because they move super fast up there. But mm -hmm. in the Midwest, we got to go slower because they're a little more laid back um, or in the Southeast or age groups, whatever that case may be. Um, and you can tailor your orchestrations to that. You don't have to change what the salesperson does. 
but a lot of those other activities you can use to really dial in that engagement. And introduce more nuances to your, to yeah. your personalization efforts, right? If you know this is my segment and it's it's small to mid-sized organizations that have seen growth in these areas that are, uh, uh, you know, they've just invested $10 million in a marketing budget or, you know, $5 million in an IT budget and you're an IT service provider. That is a different kind of, of segment that you can introduce, but not only the segment, that's the reason for the, the MarTech stack, right? Yep. Uh, we're introducing these technologies because the hypothesis is that if I introduce this technology, it helps me elevate and scale up the way that I could introduce the, the different messaging and personalization is at the, the, the heart of it all. But you need the, the hyper segmentation in order for you to orchestrate in that fashion. So 100%. Great. All great points. Wrap it up since we have only for a few minutes left. Um, if you could leave one piece of advice for today's topic, what would it be, Hassam? Um, tools are great. Tools are shiny. Tools will have different kinds of promises. Uh, when you evaluate them, uh, evaluate them for the sake of efficiency. Um, look at them from a point of scale and do not look at your pain point as, ex as it exists today. Think about it in the future. If you're going to buy a tool or if you're going to introduce something new to your tech stack, think about it uh, today and what will it solve and how it will play a role in, um, in your day-to-day uh, uh, -day work um, in a year or two years down the line. Great. Anything from you, Andrew? So many things I'd love to share, but only one, you know, parting piece of advice about MarTech stack. Um, and I think it would be, uh, you know, look at your vendors as partners, not just vendors. Mm. Uh, if they're only there to, to talk about why their one thing's going to solve all your problems, uh, they're the wrong partner for you. Uh, and so I would ask them, what can they not do? Mm. Uh, that's where you're going to find out just how honest they are and if they're truly aligned to helping you with your bigger issue. Um, and if they can identify, here's what we don't do, but here's how we plug in with someone else. Here's some people I can introduce you to. Um, mm -hmm. That's the company you want to work with because they're going to be aligned to your long-term objectives. Great point. And now I'm going to toss it back over to Becca to wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Andrew and Hassam. That was an awesome conversation. We had lots of engagement from the audience. So thanks so much for offering up, you know, your pieces of advice, your personal experiences throughout sort of this MarTech stack journey. It's been awesome to hear from you. Um, just really quick reminder to everyone who's still with us, we will be sending out the on-demand recording uh, within two business days of this session. Uh, feel free to, you know, share the love, spread the knowledge uh, with your colleagues and peers. Um, and there will be a survey that pops up. We would love to get your feedback um, and how we can improve this in the future for everyone. This won't be the last Act on Zoom Info webinar, to be sure. Um, so until the next time, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Thank y'all. Thank you. Bye.